So the assessment, broadly speaking, now to capture all the different parameters that go within it, we have talked about the patient reported outcomes, so Epworth, snoring, quality of life, any associated daytime nasal obstruction because that's where it starts. So they do the nose questionnaire and all of those things can be done outside of the consultation room before and after. Vigilance testing, so all of my patients do a two minute computerized vigilance test and then we record the time and see what changes um, treatment is making in that. Uh, comorbidities of course and then dynamic upper airway assessment, that's crucial. It can be just awake in a supine position with different maneuvers, and I'll just talk you through that real quick. And it can be a uh, drug-induced sleep endoscopy using BIS as a uh, correlate for EEG um, readings just to make sure that the patient is um, asleep at the right level because if you sedate someone too much, any, everyone will have sleep apnea. And if they're not asleep enough, then we don't see, we might underreport the, the, the problem. Uh, selected patients with suspected skeletal abnormality as an underlying cause uh, might have cephalometry. And then, of course, sleep study, that's the crux um, of the, the, the um, uh, diagnosis. So um, thankfully, I removed the video. So with the photos, it'll be a bit easy. So this is an example just of a patient uh, of mine. Um, we are looking at Friedman tongue position of one. Uh, you can see the tip of the uvula nicely and kind of grade one tonsils, maybe grade two. Uh, at least he was referred as a grade one tonsil. Looking with the endoscope, you're looking behind through the nose. Then you're looking down towards the, uh, the uvulas hanging in midair there palate is just there, you're looking at the epiglottis, uh, posterior wall and lateral walls. And what happens with modified Muller maneuver, both tonsils just collapse completely and close the airway completely. So even though it looks like a grade one, and that's generally the only upper airway assessment they will have unless they see an ENT. Um, their tonsils are doing that, so um, that's the kind of pneumatic stenting that CPAP will have to do to keep those bulky tonsils apart. Um, further down at the level of the tongue base, retrolingual airway, you again see a complete transverse collapse driven by the tonsils. And you would not see that unless the patient had an upper airway endoscopic examination. He showed a really good improvement in his retrolingual airway, if you compare these two pictures, just by sticking his lower jaw forward. So he had a nose issue, and I corrected his nose with a rhinoplasty because otherwise he would not be able to keep a splint in. He would just open his mouth while sleeping and drop it out every night. But after the nose operation, he loves the splint, and he just uses that, despite the fact that the tonsils were collapsing. So I did not push him towards surgery. Um, but in fact, if he did have uvulopalatophrangoplasty and had those chunky tonsils removed, then uh, you know, he's in the favorable category of um, uh, getting a good surgical result. But again, it's all about informed decision making rather than me telling the patient, this is what you should do. Um, so same guy, you can see at the level of the tongue base, the two walls, side walls are coming together, pushed by the tonsils and the palatopharyngeus muscles. This is a different patient, and you can see in his condition, the tongue base is hypertrophied. It's filling up the vellicula. You can't see the, the vellicula between the epiglottis and the tongue base, and it's just falling backwards. So this guy will need tongue base surgery, which is a bigger deal. You know, there are things that can go wrong, and so you have to make that decision kind of with a you know, full understanding of what we are trying to achieve, whether we are just trying to improve his narrowing so that then CPAP is more effective, or we are going for cure. Uh, or not cure, I shouldn't say cure, but we're going for good surgical result. So sleep study, we, we kind of know about that. Level one and level two studies, seven to 10 channels that are typically done in the lab, and three and four, which are in the community. Patients can do them at home. Looking at the Australasian Sleep Association algorithm for how to go about doing these studies to simplify that algorithm. If someone has a high probability of moderate to severe OSA based on their questionnaires, based on their history, and they don't have any cardiovascular problems or other kind of comorbidities, 
no other sleep disorders, that's important, and they can do the test at home, then they can do a th level three or four study at home. And that increases the accessibility of sleep study for patients. Um, Hamilton Hospital Sleep Service has done a fantastic uh, trial, which they have then adopted into practice, where rather than having all the patients come to hospital for a limited level one, level two studies, they de-escalated the studies to a wide group of three to four, doing it at home, overnight oximetry or level three study. And then they went straight on to CPAP. So a lot of patients, their waiting list from, from years dropped down to months or weeks. And a lot of patients could get on to CPAP a lot quicker. So um, a lot of papers show that about 80% of patients will actually be quite suited to just having the sleep, uh, home sleep study. And if that does not fit in with their picture, if that does not confirm OSA or does not give us answers, then they can go on to do a level one, two study. Unless, of course, they have a low probability of OSA, but they have cardiovascular problems. They're, they've had a heart attack and or they're a heavy truck driver and you know they need to do a proper lab-based sleep study. A lot of these patients, if they can get access and treatment with, with or without a level three or four study, we are probably meeting them there rather than leaving them untreated because of lack of resources, lack of testing, lack of CPAP machines availability or funding, and then have them develop cardiovascular or, or metabolic problems and then have the ambulance meet them at the bottom of the cliff. So um, that's um, quite a lot of um, emphasis at the moment. Um, treatment, we'll go through all of these um, quickly, um, but that's the ladder of treatment. So first of all, lifestyle measures, so a big um, um, push towards quitting smoking, regulate alcohol intake, sleep hygiene, sleep hygiene, sleep hygiene, <laughs> um, weight loss, easier said than done. And again, I see a lot of patients with high BMI and they've got really chunky tonsils. They, are, they will be a good surgical <coughs> candidate, but I tell them, why don't you try CPAP? Oh, I don't want to be tied to a machine for the rest of my life. And I say, look, if you try CPAP and it works really well, your energy levels go up, you can get to the gym better, you won't crave junk foods as much, and you can start losing weight a little bit less with a little bit less difficulty or a little bit more easily. Maybe six months down the line, if your BMI normalizes, uh, you might not need CPAP. So don't think of it as a, you, you know, you, you're gone now, you're, you're tied to it for life. It might be a temporary thing. And if you've lost weight, you still have some CPAP, uh, some sleep apnea and it's got better <coughs> and you want to have surgery then, your surgery will be safer, you know, and you'll recover from it easier. So again, it's about, like you said right in the beginning, Bruce, managing expectations and, you know, being realistic about that. There are quite a few smartphone apps. Uh, Snore Labs is a good one, which records the snoring and and also kind of other airway issues. N um, not medically recommended, it's not like FDA approved or whatever, but it's a good app. And there's a few others. Fitbits, so they analyze how well we sleep and everything. How am I doing for time? Yeah. Count to 12, yeah, no, just keep checking on. Okay, um, but they're developing predictalinetics apps, so they, you put in your data, what's your, what's your sleep, uh, what is your sleep apnea severity or your blood pressure le um, level or your, stat or your cholesterol levels uh, or your HbA1c. And then it'll, it'll tell you in 10 years time, if you don't do anything, you'll be dead or this is what your face will look like. You know? And so they're doing it with smoking, but people are developing labs, uh, apps for um, you know, sleep apnea or a lot of other uh, problem. So uh, just a little bit of kind of maybe scare people into action kind of thing. So another simple um, treatment modality, um, elbow um, uh, in, the, yeah. in the ribs. <laughs> so uh, positional sleep training, um, tennis ball in the waistband. Um, and then there are apps which gently vibrate without waking you up so they don't 
raise up the heart rate and everything, but uh, motivate the patient to turn over. Night shift or night balance, which goes around the waistband, so it's, some people don't find that claustrophobic, and they might do with the night shift sitting around their neck. Um, and then there are smartphone apps that will also vibrate based on your body position, and you can strap them onto your shin so it just vibrates against your bone. It doesn't wake you up. We know about CPAP, 100% efficacy, so I try to push everyone towards CPAP. Um, we do understand that longitudinal studies in thousands of patients across 20 years mm -hmm. has shown that the biggest motivator is daytime tiredness and improvement with CPAP. Otherwise, people tend to fall off the wagon, and the long-term compliance can be as low as 34%, but 50% perhaps, and they've tried CBT and everything, and uh, it's, it's not as good as we want it to be. And again, that's based on criteria that were kind of randomly selected many years ago, saying four hours of CPAP use every night for four nights a week is enough, but then that, that was not on the basis of research. That was just randomly decided. So in effect, if actually you look at the, the unprotected time, so the other three to four hours every night for the three nights of the week, uh, that may not be enough for the cardiovascular protection. And we'll see that in just a second. Mandible advancement devices, they're expensive. They're not covered by uh, insurance here. Um, as compared to Australia, they're not easily available in the public system. Um, they show about a 65%, 60%, 65% overall effectiveness. I give all of my patients a cheap uh, splint that they can boil and bite and kind of fashion mold at home, and <coughs> we help them through the clinic. And if they find uh, that that is effective, then they can consider a one-time investment into a custom-made one. Long-term use, yes, they ha there are some occlusion side effects, but that's a, uh, you know, if someone's retronathic, then they might actually uh, enjoy that benefit of um, occlusal change. Surgery. Um, traditionally, maxillary mandibular advancement is kind of touted as the, the evidence-based accepted surgical, surgical alternative to CPAP. Uh, it is morbid. It is a, you know, big operation. Um, bariatric surgery is accepted as an alternative surgical treatment, but oropharyngeal surgery is gathering evidence with time. And traditionally, this kind of surgery where you tr trimmed off part of the soft palate and uvula caused that circumferential scarring which actually narrowed the oropharyngeal aperture with time and made things worse over time. So that, that's where surgery gained ill repute in the past. But modern, all variants of modern UP3, modified UP3, rely on changing the vectors of scarring so that the scarring actually pulls um, the, the, the oropharynx wider open with time. So not dramatically wider open, but it basically counteracts the long-term kind of flaccidity of tissues and gives more sustainable results. So five-year results are well-sustained. Um, in selected patients, if the hard palate is really long and it's pushing the soft palate back, then they can have a transoral palatal advancement. And that is in lieu of maxillary advancement, which involves, you know, skull-based osteotomies and all that, or not skull-based, but facial osteotomies. And so a lot less morbid procedure done within an hour. Um, Tongue-based re reduction, so y you can have just these minimally invasive radiofrequency treatments through the oral tongue, addressing the tongue base, causing ablation and scarring, which pulls the back of the tongue forwards. And Stuart Mackay's group in um, Brisbane has published some fantastic data on uh, multi-level, so along with palate procedure, uh, tongue base reduction, uh, showing equivalent benefits to uh, effectiveness to maxillary mandibular advancement. The case selection has to be really selective. Uh, really good. Hired suspension where the hired bone can be pulled forwards and create retrolingual expansion. A lot of centers in Europe do it. Advantage is that it's reversible, so you're not chucking, uh, you're not, you know, cutting big chunks of tongue base out and things like that. And if the patient doesn't like it because they 
it can interfere with the sensation of swallowing and give a bit of a globus sensation. You can just um, release the, the tether, the, the suture just under the chin and they can go back, you know, if they don't like it. But not a lot of centers um, are doing it. This is the newest kit on the block. Um, a cuff electrode around the terminal branches of the hypoglossal nerve, uh, which stimulates the geniohyoid and the genioglossus, which basically pulls the tongue forward. And it, it runs off uh, either freehold or um, based on, a, uh, on an electrode which picks up when you're inspiring, so it opens up the airway only when you inspire. And five-year results from um, Europe and the US are fantastic. It has to be really well selected, of course. It's not available in Australasia at the moment. But for selected patients, this will be a future. Non-ablative surgery all through the neck. It's re reversible, so if you want to pull it out, you can ha have it pulled out. Great results in older patients. So if you've got a 65-plus patient with sleep apnea and they don't want to have and they should not have big, painful throat operations, they can have this. And of course, tracheostomy as a bypass for you know really comorbid patients. Outcomes. So traditionally we looked at AHI, but now we're looking at you know overall what's the oxygen desaturation index, what's the what the lowest oxygen saturation levels are, what is the time you spent below 90% of saturation, daytime sleepiness, vigilance test, control of hypertension, insulin resistance and obesity, performance and productivity. So Graham asked me if we, we could include some um, evidence for surgery. So um, this is a, an old study that they did on conventional UP3, which was not as effective as modified UP3 now, and CPAP, and looked at survival and the, um, in uh, a bunch of VA patients in, in the US, and they found that UP3 actually conferred a better protection or it was associated with better survival rates over time. And this is a more recent randomized control trial in Karolinska uh, in Sweden, and they have looked at uh, modified uvulopalatopharyngoplasty, immediate improvements in um, AHI, in sleepiness, in vigilance test results, in blood pressure, and that has been sustained up to two, 24 months or two years out. That's so one of the more recent RCTs, which are kind of building up high-level evidence. So what is the outlook? From moving from what is the best cure for OSA, more and more we are realizing that there's no cure for, you, for OSA. But if someone's headed to doom, increasing complications, and we can bring their graph down a little bit, and then they still keep going along the same trajectory, they are still overall across their lifetime at a lower risk of complications. So that's where we are headed, how best we control it. Success depends on what parameter we studied. Nobody is going to walk around thinking, I'm cured, looking at their sleep study result or a photo of their throat. What matters is what matters to them. If they're a truck driver, can they drive safely? Um, uh, you know, if they're... Um, if they're a student, are they working? Are they, are, you know, are their grades better in school? So therefore, treatment has to be personalized, has to be tailor-made, and unfortunately, as a corollary, time-intensive. But you know, better treatment is better than you know mismanaged treatment. And so I tell all my patients, look, it's not in and out the door that I'll operate on you and then you're gone because you can have problems in future. So we're going to be friends for life. Thank <laughs> you.